morning. I'll get senior tanan tanan. Blessing is always to gather together with you this morning. Looking forward to continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. Hoping you had a wonderful Christmas. But before we begin, let's open up with a word of prayer. Salam liwat gino para sa niyad na, Father. We just thank you for the time as always, Lord, that you give us to get together. Lord, to be able to celebrate, Lord, this time of year. It is an amazing time of year, Lord, to remember your birth, your gift. But Lord, it's also a good time to get into your word. Lord, to learn more about you. Lord, just to ask you, speak to our hearts. You bless us in this time, Lord, as we desire to learn about how to run the race you set before us with endurance. Father, how to be able to finish, Lord, and find the grace that you have given to us. So Lord, we pray that you bless this time. Minister to us now, we ask and say, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you recall, son, like Ligad, that we've been going over through the book of Hebrews, the fact that Jesus is better than everyone and everything. Having spent ten some chapters establishing this, the author turned the corner and told us now that the just must live by faith. It's not enough that Jesus is better than everyone and everything. We need to put our trust, our faith in Christ. And he gave us 19 examples in what we call the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, a record of some of the greatest men and women of the Old Testament. But then he concluded last week by telling us that we also must ourselves walk that walk. We must ourselves live by faith. We must run the race that is set before us. And like any good race, it's pretty easy to start, not that difficult to get going, not too easy to finish. That's what gets difficult. Uh, actually completing the race, having the endurance to go through to the very end. And he gave us four tools to help us with our endurance. First of all, there was a cloud of witnesses. Speaking of those Old Testament saints that have been given to us in Hebrews 11, who showed us what kind of a race that is coming to us. Not going to be easy. Not going to be simple. It's going to require us giving up everything in order to win, in order to get to that finish line. But to give us a second aid to be able to help us in this race, and that's to cast off, lay aside every weight that so easily weighs us down. Because you don't go into a race carrying extra weight. You want to be as light as you can be to give you the endurance to finish. What is the weight that weighs us down? The sin in life that so easily tries to trap us. But there's a third thing we're given as an aid to run this race, according to our study last time we were together, and that is to make sure we run the course that is set before us. And and we talked about this in depth, mentioning that the course that has been set is to be obedient to the word that God has given to us. Do we obey the word of God? set the course that's before us, or do we disobey and try to do things our way? That would not help us finish the race. But as Atapusan, the fourth and final aid was looking to Jesus Christ himself. For he is the author and the finisher. Literally meaning that he's the one that showed us the way on how to finish the race. How did Jesus finish? By taking up his cross. Amomansa aton. We must also give up our life, take up our cross daily. Luke chapter 9 verses 23 tells us. In order to be able to effectively run the race, complete the race, finish it. So that we can see Jesus Christ in heaven. Run the race that is set before us. Well, that being the case, we continue this morning in Hebrews chapter 12 beginning in verse 5. As we're going to look at two more things that aid us in our race. The first one is discipline that comes from God. The second one is forgiveness that we need towards others. Let's pick up our study. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. We'll read down to verse 17 this morning. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son... Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all of us have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. 
Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths of your feet so that that which is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble and by it many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sowed his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So the author continues as we move on into the second portion here of Hebrews chapter 12, giving us aids for how to effectively run our race, to have endurance so that we can finish our race. The first aid that we are given here in verses 5 through 11 is the discipline that comes from God. God disciplines us in an effort to allow us to finish our race. And we're going to see this in seven ways. Seven ways in which God disciplines us. Notice, to begin with there in verse 5, we always forget why we are disciplined. For notice it says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. <clears throat> when we choose to sin, there's always going to be consequences. There is a price that must be paid. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And therefore, if we choose sin, if we live a lifestyle of sin, then we are certainly going to face the consequences, the punishment that comes along from that sin. And when we face that punishment, we always forget. Now, I found this interesting because this is an absolute statement, meaning that every single time, per milipatkita, we're always forgetting why we are being punished by the Lord. And that forgetting means that we don't understand or we miss, don't miss this, the encouragement that God speaks to us as children. What encouragement is God trying to speak to us that we don't remember, we always forget? Well, notice the author proceeds to quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. Meaning, what we forget when we are punished is the word of God. God tries to speak to us. He's constantly trying to convince us not to give over, not to fall into a lifestyle of sin. And if we're willing to listen to His Word, listen to Him, His Word will keep us from sin. But if we choose to sin, then we don't want to hear His Word. It keeps us from being able to listen to, we reject, we don't want to hear from God or His Word. Psalm chapter 119 verse 11 says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, it is the word of God that is the very first thing we forget when we fall into sin. But if we choose to be in the word of God, it will help keep us from sin. So the first thing we note in this discipline we have from the Lord is, is that when we choose to sin, we're going to forget what God says. But there's a second thing we notice in verse 5, and that's not to despise. For notice it goes on to say, quoting from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Now this word despised, only used here, so belongs the New Testament, carries the idea of thinking of something being unimportant, something not having relevance. And what it's referring to is the chastening that comes from God. Literally, that word can be translated as the training of God. 
when we are punished as a result of our sin, as a consequence of our actions, we can think of the training that comes from that, the chastisement or the punishment that comes from that is being unimportant if we are not careful. Because the reason why we are being punished is to try to train us, teach us to live a holy life. If you have a young child who you have warned many, many times not to touch a hot flame, but it's so pretty they go. The light is sanag sanagid, guapo gid, nami nami gig nochura. And they want to go over and touch it. You go, don't touch that. Basimana inika, basino. You're going to get burned. You're going to hurt. Basik sikit sa imo. And you go, no, 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 I want to touch it. They only have to choose to do that once. And the one time they touch that flame, it will hurt so much. The consequence, the punishment from their action will be so severe, they will learn never ever to touch a hot flame again. That is exactly the point of the consequences and the punishment that we receive from the Lord. He is trying to teach us and train us. Therefore, we should not despise the consequences, the chastisement that comes as a result of us choosing to live in sin. Do not forget... Do not despise the training or the chastisement of the Lord. But there's a third way God disciplines us. Notice again in verse 5, for it goes on that we are not also to be discouraged. Because it says, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by the Lord. Now, there are two different ways potentially that we can react to being punished by God for our sin. On the one hand, we might think little of it. Try to ignore it. Try to just bypass it rather than be taught by it. But on the flip side, it might overwhelm us. We might become discouraged by the punishment. Not thinking nothing of it. That's the one side. But becoming overwhelmed by it. As if God is up there and He's just angry at us. He's this big, mean guy in heaven who's got this big old stick that he just wants to smack us with every time we step out of line, as if God somehow just loves to punish us as his kids. But the reality is that is not God's heart whatsoever. God doesn't beat us up just because we step out of line. God is trying to train us, teach us, because he wants us to live a holy life. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says we are confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in us will complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. Listen, don't be discouraged when you are chastised by the Lord, when we get chastised by the Lord, when we're punished by God, because what it means is not that he's angry, but that he's trying to train us, prepare us, purify us, teach us to live a holy life. Number four, the author goes on in this discipline that comes from God to describe the motive behind it. For notice in verse six, he says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now this word love here is the word agapeo. It's that perfect, self-sacrificial, unconditional love that describes how God cares passionately for us. A God who loves us so much, He was willing to die for our sins. This same love that put Jesus on our cross is the identical love that means that we get punished when we make mistakes. It is the love, the revelation of the love of God that punishes us when we choose to live and rebel and go to sin. I had a friend many years ago whose parents, interestingly enough, never disciplined him. He could do biskananolam. There was no limits, no boundaries. Whatever he wanted to do, whatever he wanted to go, however he wanted to live his life, his parents kind of just let him. As a result, somewhat predictably, he began to do crazier and more dangerous things. Till one day he got this idea that he thought he could steal a car. He didn't need the money. His parents were quite wealthy. It was just the thrill. It was just the, you know, breaking the boundaries. So late one night, he broke into someone's house and stole their car. 
No, he did have a problem. And his problem was he'd never ever driven a car before. He was still quite young. Bata Pasha, maybe 14 years old, 15 years old. And so as he's joyriding down some dark streets late one night, because he's got little experience, he doesn't make a corner. He tried to turn and he met a tree and a very devastating accident, one that probably should have killed him on the spot. Miraculously, he lived, but it was the middle of the night and there was nobody around and he was still quite injured. Somebody found him, called the paramedics, helped rescue him, get him out of the vehicle. But when he went to ask where this man who had found him was, everyone said, we don't even know who you're talking about. We don't know who found you. This person who you say helped you out of the car, we never saw him. <laughs> to this day, he's pretty convinced it was an angel that actually saved his life. <coughs> well, fast forward about a year after spending quite some time in the hospital and quite a bit more time under house arrest. He was underage, so he didn't go to prison, but he still was under house arrest. He shows up at my door, knocks on my door. I open up and I go, hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? His first words out of his mouth were, tell me about Jesus. I need to know who this God is. And my dad, fortunately, happened to be overhearing. I was still quite young and, and not so good at presenting the gospel message. My father stepped in and shared Jesus Christ. He got saved there and then on the spot. But my point in all saying that is simply this. Consequences for actions. Consequences that his parents never taught him, interestingly. But that God refused to allow him to get away with. His consequences broke him, humbled him to bring him to Jesus Christ. Because the most loving thing God can ever do to us when we're living in sin is to allow us to be broken so that we come to Him and can be forgiven of our sin. God loves those whom He chastens. Number five. There's a fifth thing that we notice about the discipline of God, though, there in verses six through eight. And that's that not only does God love those that He chastens, but He scourges every son whom He receives. Now, this word scourges is interesting only appears seven times to be in the New Testament. And almost always it is used to describe a violent beating. Not something mild, not something casual, violent. It is the same word used to describe what happened to Jesus Christ when Pontius Pilate had him beaten nearly to death prior to his crucifixion there in John chapter 19, verse 1. Now the idea is simply this, the picture is powerful. When God chastises us, when we're punished by the God, sometimes it is extremely severe. God is not light. He's not gentle. He doesn't hold anything back when it comes to punishing His kids. Which makes sense. Because oftentimes you might sit there and go, well, if God loves me, why would God punish me? Well, because God knows sin is deadly. I, I fear too often we make light of sin as if it's no big deal. Yeah, I lied. Yeah, I stole. Yeah, I looked at that picture on the internet I probably should not have. Yeah, I did those things, but it's no big deal, right? No big deal? Jesus was crucified God put himself on a cross to pay for our sin. Sin is an extremely big deal. And I think sometimes we forget just how deadly it is. The only reason people will not go to heaven is because they do not accept the price that was paid for their sin. Sin is what keeps us out of the presence of God, separates us from God. Sin is an enormously big deal, which is why God is willing to do anything, everything, to try to keep us from it. There's nothing God will not hold back. No punishment too severe to try to keep us away from sin, because sin will keep us away from God and keep us out of heaven. Punishment of God, the scourging of God, can be extremely harsh. But don't miss, God only punishes His kids. Look there in verse 6 again, because this is really, really powerful. 
For if we endure chastening as God deals with us as sons, because there is no son whom a father does not chasten, but if we were without chastening of whom we have all become partakers, then we are illegitimate and not sons. Meaning the only people that God's going to chasten and punish are the ones that belong to Him. If God's not punishing us, maybe we aren't His. You know, if I saw a young child running out into the street, I might say something, yell at them, because I'd be concerned for their safety. But I wouldn't punish them. That's not my position. I'm not their parent. Pero kung ako bata, kung si Helel, talagang hampang sa dalan, Man, I would be spanking her quick. If my child's running out on the street, you better believe I'm going to punish her because she belongs to me. You see, God's only going to punish His children. He's not going to punish those who do not belong to Him. Meaning, you might sit there and get upset sometimes and go, Naasay man sa mga tao, kung may sala sa ila kabuhi, wala pinahanhalan sa ginoo. You know, why doesn't God punish other people? Why do they get away with that? You watch on the news, you see in media, you watch on Facebook, the way some of the people live their lives. And you're going, about, why, why does God not you know, strike them with a bolt of lightning from heaven right as they stand there? Simple. They are not His children. God will only punish those that belong to Him. Which means, by the way, in a really kind of interesting way, when we get hardship, when we face challenges, when we are punished for the choices we make, it actually should bring great comfort to us. Because it means that we belong to Jesus. It means He loves us. Some of us, I think He loves an awful lot. We get a lot of punishment. But needless to say, it proves we are the children of God. There's a sixth thing we notice in verses 9-10 through 10 regarding the discipline that comes from the Lord, and that's an example of the Father. For notice it says there in verse 9, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who have corrected us. And now stop right here for a moment. Because I find it interesting that the author chooses to use as an example of our heavenly Father, our earthly fathers. Because the dads, the mga tatay dali sa kalibutan, are supposed to be an example for us of what our Heavenly Father is like. I fear too often, fathers, dads, we forget that it is our responsibility to be the spiritual leaders of our homes. If a dad makes church important, if a dad makes following Jesus a key part of the life of his family, the rest of his family will follow. The children will also have that value. If a dad sits there and goes, ah, you don't have to go to church, or I'm not going to go to church, you go without me. If he thinks it's unimportant to make Jesus a part of the life of his family, his kids, his wife are going to follow suit. We as the fathers are supposed to be the examples to our children. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, You are to teach your children the fear and the admonition of the Lord. This is the command we have regarding being a father. That is the whole purpose why God has given us to have children, is to raise them up to become godly men and women. Dads are to be the ones to teach and instruct their kids. And part of that, don't miss this, is correcting them. We had human fathers who corrected us. There's a tendency, I think, sometimes to kind of let kids just do whatever they want to do. You know, dads, it's too much effort, it's too difficult. You know, whatever the kids, however the kids want to do, whatever they feel like doing, let them do it. But that's not what we should be doing. We are called to be teaching them, preparing them, giving them the consequences of their actions so they learn to live in holiness. They learn what it means to be able to follow Jesus Christ. Listen, if your child is rebellious, spank them. If they do something they shouldn't, give them consequences. Better to give them small consequences now and train them than to leave them to their own devices and later on have them face much more difficult consequences, end up in prison or perhaps even dead because they never learned those lessons. 
We are to be training our children to follow the Lord. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Sin is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it from him. Proverbs twenty three thirteen. Do not fail to correct your children. They will not die if you spank them, <laughs> but they might if you don't. This is the idea is that we as earthly fathers are to be the examples we are to be correcting and training our kids. Which is interesting because you notice if we go on there in verse 9, and we paid our earthly fathers respect. One of the things that's the hardest to do as a dad is to correct our children. You know, if we punish them, spank them, give them some kind of a discipline, we wonder if they're going to grow up bitter and never forgive us, if we're somehow warping them and, you know, they're never going to want to talk to us once they get to be a certain age. But actually, just the opposite takes place. A dad who's willing to train, teach, bring correction to his children is a father whose children will grow up to respect him because they'll understand that he did it because he loves them and wants them to become godly young men and women. Dads, correct your children. Then they will respect you when they become adults themselves. But the author goes on in verse 10 to now contrast this. Having laid out earthly fathers, he says, shall we not much more readily then be in subjection to our father of spirits and live? For our earthly fathers did indeed for a few days chastise us as seemed best to them, but our heavenly father for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So here's the idea. If we submit ourselves to earthly fathers who do their best, pero, they're still human, they're still flawed, to teach us and to train us, how much more should we submit ourselves to a heavenly Father who makes no mistakes, who in everything He does only desires to bring us into a better relationship of holiness with Him. Ultimately, He's going to be the very best trainer that we could ever have. As I thought about this, it was pretty heavy for my heart. I look at my little girl and I realize that what I do, how I am a father, ultimately is going to teach her what her heavenly father is like. Dads, we are representing, we stand in the place of, we are the, if you might say, hands and feet of our heavenly father in the lives of our children. They learn to relate to God to the punishment of God, to the love of God, to the training of God, as they see us love, punish, and train them. What an immense responsibility, opportunity we are given to allow our children to understand just how amazing their Heavenly Father is, to prepare them, equip them to one day follow after and submit themselves to their Father that is in heaven. The sixth thing we notice is, is that we do have a dad in heaven and we earthly fathers should be preparing our children to follow after him. Number seven. The seventh and final thing we notice about the discipline of the Lord there in verse 11 is the purpose that God has in it. For notice, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Now I can relate to this. My dad, amazing man, by the way. I was blessed, and I truly understand it was a blessing to have an extraordinary father growing up, a very godly man. But I was a pretty rebellious young kid. I got in trouble quite frequently. And my dad had a pretty set method for dealing with my rebellion and my sin, and it was the belt. I knew that belt well. If I made a mistake, I got out of line, I rebelled. Off came the belt. And I knew that was coming to my bottom with some pretty quick snaps. I hated that belt. I feared that belt. I had dreams, nightmares about that belt. But I missed the point. For the belt was just the tool 
that was being used in the moment, and it was painful, let me tell you, to achieve a much greater purpose. It was meant to be a deterrent to sin. Listen, if punishments didn't hurt, if there was no strong reason why we shouldn't sin, then there'd be nothing to keep us from doing it. There has to be a severe consequence, a painful penalty, in order for us to really get the lesson and realize this is not something we should do. Because, though it is painful in the moment, afterwards, notice verse 11 again, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. Now this word trained I found interesting. It's literally the word gymnasio. We would understand that as the word gymnastics. It physically speaks about someone who's working out. And here's the picture. We get trained. We are exercised. We learn how to live righteously, not by accident. It doesn't just happen one day that we go, I think I'm going to live a good life. I think I'm going to be a godly person today. No, we're trained through punishment. We learn through painful consequences. We're trained, we're exercised by the difficulties we go through to teach us to live a righteous, holy life. The punishment of God has one single purpose. And that's to teach us to walk away, to reject sin, and instead to live a righteous life for the Lord. The discipline of the Lord has the purpose of allowing us to have endurance so we can finish the race and not be tripped up by the sin that so easily seeks to ensnare us. But that brings us to the second thing we want to notice. We mentioned there were two aids in helping us in our race. The first one being the discipline of the Lord there in verses 5 through 11. But there's a second one in verses 12 through 17, and that's the necessity of forgiveness. The first thing we want to notice there in verses 12 through 13 is the strengthening that we need. For we're told, therefore, strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight your paths. Now, this word strengthened and the word straight there are both fundamentally the same word. It means to make something no longer crooked, something that's bent out of place, bring it back to being straight once again. And the picture is powerful. For when we come underneath the weight of the punishment of God, it can cripple us. Our hands just kind of limp down. We're going, oh, it's too much. I can't handle this. You know, our knees begin to quake underneath the load and the weight of God's burden. Our feet just get all bent out of shape and we can hardly stand up anymore because our sin has broken us. Now, that may seem like a bad thing. In fact, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 tells us that pride, relying upon ourselves, rebelling against God, choosing to live a lifestyle of sin, this is pride, brings destruction. And an arrogant spirit comes before a fall. Sure enough, that's what's being described here. Someone who lives in sin, hands go down, knees begin to quake, feet begin to go crooked because of the weight of the burden of God's punishment upon them. But there's something interesting going on here in the original language in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. For the word translated fall comes from the word actually just to be broken. And the word translated as arrogant comes from the root word that just means to have weak knees. And the idea is simply this, when we attempt to live our life our way, rebel against God, live in sin, yes, He does have us fall. Yes, He does make us weak in the knees. So we are humbled. So we can be broken and receive His grace. For we're told in James chapter 4, verse 6, 1 Peter 5, 5, that God resists the proud, but He pours out His grace upon the humble. And as we understand the reason for the punishment of God, we understand why we have been broken. It opens us up to receive now the grace, the help, the aid, the forgiveness that God desires to give us. But notice it's not just the making straight. 
Specifically, he said, the paths of your feet. And I found this reference to paths interesting. For this paths of your feet is only used here, sabi lok sa New Testament naman, wala sa iban. It literally speaks of a wagon wheel that has been tread over on the same road so many times it has made a deep rut. Here's the idea. If you have a dirt road that cars go by all the time, Eventually, on that dirt road, you're going to see the trail of the car tires dig into it so that you see a very well-worn path. There's no questioning or doubting that you'll go, hey, cars have gone by here a lot because there's deep ruts that have been formed along the road. That's this word path. And I like it because what it speaks of is that us having to be trained, us having to go through punishment, us having to be able to learn discipline from the Lord is the path that is very well worn. Everybody else has had to go through this path before us. And everybody will go through it also after us. <laughs> you might sit there and think, no one's ever gone through what I'm going through. No one understands the challenges or the trials or the difficulties I'm having in life. Not so. There is nothing unique about what we face. Nothing unique about the challenges that we're going through. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us that our trials in life are no different than what anyone else experiences. We are on a very well-worn path. Therefore, strengthen, make straight our path that is well-worn so that, notice there at the end of verse 13, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Now, this idea of our dislocation speaks of the fact that we have turned aside from the path. If we don't watch ourselves, if we're not careful, we may walk away from the Lord because of the punishment of God, missing the fact that His punishment comes from a heart of love to His children to desire to heal us, restore us, and help us to live a holy life. Therefore, strengthen our hands, Come up underneath that weight of the Lord, recognize the purpose of it, and be healed. Literally be forgiven. For the moment we simply turn back to Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us, the moment we confess our sins to Him, He restores us. He heals us. Hebrews 10, 17, He removes our sin from us and never remembers it again. Therefore, we can be forgiven as we remember the purpose behind the discipline of God and come to Him in humility. But there's a second thing we notice about forgiveness there in verse 14, and that's that we are to pursue it. Now, first, we're to pursue peace with all men. Now, this word pursue is in the present tense meaning we are to constantly be seeking after peace with absolutely everyone. And now the context would seem to refer to and point towards making forgiveness, being forgiven by others because of the sin and the damage we have done in our lives. Because first and foremost, all sin ultimately is against God. Psalm chapter 51 verse 4 tells us that Psalmist David writing says, Against you and you, O Lord, have I done this great evil. His sin was against God first and foremost. But it's not just God who is affected. Uh, once we have received forgiveness from the Lord, we must now also go and address those who have been harmed by our choices. People who are close to us, friends, family, our loved ones who are damaged because of what we said, what we did, how we acted. We hurt them by our sin. And we need to pursue peace, seek to be restored and reconciled, ask for forgiveness from them. But not just to be forgiven, we also need to be forgiving. For notice in the second half of verse 14, we're also to pursue holiness without which no one can see the Lord. Now this word holiness that we're to be pursuing speaks of being set apart, different from the world that is around us. When someone in the world is hurt, if you harm them, offend them, do them wrong, 
they rarely, if ever, will forgive you. And even if they say they forgive you, they will never forget what you have done. You will never see the relationship restored back to the place that it was originally. This is the nature of the world. They hold on to with bitterness the hurts that people have done against them. We are to be set apart, holy, not like that. We are to be forgiving of everyone, no matter what they ever do to us. You're going, really? No matter what anyone does? I mean, they could sin as many times as they want to, do as much bad towards me as they feel like, and I still need to forgive them? Yes. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus has forgiven us of every sin, completely washed away everything we've ever done. Therefore, having been completely forgiven, how can we not also there likewise forgive others, no matter what they may happen to do to us? Jesus actually takes it a step further in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. He says, if we do not forgive, He will not forgive us. This idea of forgiveness is absolutely essential in our Christian walk. We must seek to be forgiven, to undo the damage we've done to others, but we must also be forgiving, show ourselves, pursue holiness, so that we can show the world that Jesus is in us. That brings us to a third and final thing we want to notice about forgiveness, and that's do not become bitter there in verses 15 through 17. For notice it says, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now this idea of looking carefully is to be on guard, to be protecting against the danger of falling short, literally failing to complete the race and achieve the grace of God or the gift of God that is our salvation in heaven. We don't want to fall. We want to make sure we don't stumble and not complete the race that God has put before us. What would cause us to stumble? A root of bitterness that springs up and causes trouble that ultimately may make us defiled. So when we hold on to things that people do to us, it causes a root of bitterness to grow up inside of us. And that root of bitterness can keep us from running the race. It can disqualify us in following after Jesus. Not just us, sadly to say. It also can spread out and pollute others. It can defile others. It is extremely deadly to have unforgiveness in a Christian's life. Now, there's a tendency in our culture to kind of avoid people when they do something wrong. If someone sins against us, someone hurts us, someone hurts us, we just kind of ignore them, pretend like they don't exist, and figure eventually, dugay dugay na lang, we'll be able to come to some kind of a, a peaceable arrangement, give it five, ten, or however many years. I may never like you again, but I'll probably be able to look at you again one day. And maybe things will get better eventually. But that is not a biblical perspective. For there is then a root of bitterness that wells up inside of us that will separate us from the love of Jesus Christ can potentially even keep us from finishing our race. It can cause us to stumble in our walk. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Ignoring a problem doesn't solve it, it makes it ten times larger. And ultimately opens up the door for Satan to bring division, separation into the church, into families. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we're not ignorant of how Satan works. He loves to cause division. He loves to bring separation. And unforgiveness and bitterness is one of the key tools that he wants to use. Therefore, we are not to allow bitterness to come in. We are to be on guard lest we fall short of the gift and the grace, the finish line of God that has been put before us. But the author goes on in verse 16. He said, lest, for those who do not, those who have this root of bitterness, lest there be a fornicator or a profane person among you. Now, the idea of this fornicator or profane person 
speaks of someone who's living for this life. A fornicator, someone who lives for pleasure. A profane person is someone who does not care about the things of God, but only about the things of this life. And the idea is someone who's become bitter, he's become separated from God because of their unforgiveness, is now going to begin to live just for the things of this life rather than for eternal life. Such as, or like, Esau there in verse 17, who for a morsel of food sold his birthright. Now this is an example that we're being given from back in the book of Genesis chapter 25. You may recall the story. Isaac had two children. They were twins, Kapitzila. The very firstborn was Esau, and the secondborn was Jacob. His name means heel catcher because he came out after his older brother Esau clinging on to his heel. Therefore, he was the heel catcher. He was the one that was always trying to kind of pull Esau back in, if you will, to pull him down. Well, Esau had no interest in the things of God, though he was the firstborn and should have inherited the blessing of being the one through whom the promises of Abraham and Isaac would be passed. Through him should have come the Messiah. He cared nothing about that. Esau was a bitter man who only cared about the things of this life. He was a fornicator. He was profane, living for pleasure and living for this world. Therefore, He was willing to sell his blessings, his birthright, for a bowl of soup. Jacob cooked some nice stew one day. Esau came in hungry. Give me some of that stew. Give me your birthright. Esau goes, what good's a birthright to me if I die of starvation? It's yours. Just give me some soup. And so for a bowl of soup, he sold the blessings that God had intended for him. But notice there in verse 17, again, For you know that afterwards, when Esau wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. We know the story of Esau. In fact, we're commanded to make sure we know the story of Esau, for it's an important one, that he, in the end, wanted that blessing after all. And he came to his father Isaac with tears, weeping, asking him, please bless me. But he lost the opportunity. The time to be able to receive that blessing had passed. Therefore, he was rejected. This word rejected, by the way, used nine times in the New Testament. Every other time referring to Jesus Christ being rejected. Here and here alone referring to Jesus rejecting Esau has a powerful picture. Because Esau rejected Jesus Christ, when the time came to receive the blessing, Jesus Christ rejected Esau. Therefore, even though he sought it with tears, it was too late and no blessing was given to him. Why? He did not humble himself. Under the punishment of God, he did not repent. He did not turn back to, and therefore he was never restored, and he did not finish his race. The point is powerful for you and I. We only have this life to learn to live for Jesus Christ. And the one thing that can keep us from him is the sin that so easily traps us. Therefore, God punishes us desiring to correct us as his kids, to train us to learn to live a holy life, to not get caught up in the cares of this life, but instead look for the blessings that come from heaven, the prize, the gift of God, the grace of God that is waiting for us at the end of the rice. We need to be careful not to be like Esau, not to trip and stumble, but instead to run with endurance keeping our eyes on the prize, looking forward to heaven, the goal that God has set before us. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time to get together, Lord, for the blessing you be able to get into your word, Lord, and see the opportunities, the tools you use that you give us to allow us to run the race before us with endurance. And so, Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, that you would just let us see that 
Lord, those challenges, the chastisement, Lord, that you give, Lord, are our training. You trying to show us how to live a pure and a holy life. For you chastise those who you love. You scourge those who are your sons. For you desire for us to live righteously. Lord, let us seek your forgiveness. Come boldly back to you. Seek to be restored to others who are around us, not allowing bitterness to be in our hearts. But Lord, wanting to run the race completely, desiring, Father, to finish and one day see you face to face. Lord, we come before you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Read ahead. We'll pick up this on Simana as we'll finish up chapter 12 with the final warning of the book of Hebrews. Until then, pray you have a blessed new year. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Run the race with endurance. Finish well. Receive the grace of God that is waiting for us. God bless you guys. Lord, we'll see you this on Simana Naman.